What's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Periodic Table. This is the weekly science news show we do over here on my YouTube channel where we just, well, talk about the hottest science news stories of the week. And are we experts by any means? Most of the time, no, but that's okay because this is one big virtual science classroom and we are all learning together at the same time. And that's really what it's all about. And I love doing this show every week. I am, of course, your host, Brandon Hanna. I am a mechanical engineer. You might know me also as a host formerly at AfterBuzz TV or the Popcorn Talk Network, or you might also know me from the movie Trivia Schmodown. But I am not alone today. I have an amazing guest. You might have seen him as the host, the creator, the inspiration of his own <laughs> inspiration, if that's a thing people say. Uh, it's he, happening he now. Is the he is the host of <laughs> Chew on This. It is Michael Chu. Welcome to the show. What is up, Brandon? Thank you for having me. That was an, um, the best introduction I've had on any show that I've been on so far, and I appreciate it, man. Thank you. You know, I really try my best. Normally, it's just me <laughs> kind of doing a Michael Scott where I start a sentence, and I just hope I find the words along the way. It, that one was good. Inspiration <laughs> from the inspiration. I love it. <laughs> Perfect. I'm glad you're on board. Uh, I'm super excited to talk science with you today. We've got yeah, a great man. show. Uh, we, are, we have a story about scientists burying 2,000 <laughs> pairs of underpants in Switzerland. We're going to talk about that. Why are they doing this? Uh, we also have a new technique that can make some plastic trash compostable at home, which is kind of a big deal. We all know about plastic waste. We all grew up in school learning about litter and pollution and all that. So this could be a game changer. We're going to talk about it. And of course, we do have a special segment, something I'm calling Mars Mission Report. We're going to talk about all the latest and greatest news coming from the Perseverance rover over on Mars. There's a lot of exciting experiments going on on the Red Planet. And I can't wait to just get up to date with everything going on with you guys because it's super exciting. But before we do, let's jump all the way back up to our number one story for the week. And it's why are scientists burying 2,000 pairs of underpants <laughs> in Switzerland? This one is coming from Science Focus, guys. And as always, the links to all the articles are in the description down below. If you want to check it out and read more for yourself, I highly encourage you uh, go down that Wikipedia rabbit hole and learn everything you can because that's what this is all about once again, learning. So, but guys, news in briefs, as the article says, <laughs> a study codenamed Proof by Underpants is underway in Switzerland, where researchers are sending thousands of pairs of white cotton underwear to volunteers who will bury them in, the garden, in their own gardens. And believe it or not, it's a cutting edge way to measure soil health. So I feel like our first two stories are going to be a little bit related in some Absolutely. ways. But, but scientists from the State Research Institute Agroscope will later dig up the soiled unmentionables and <laughs> analyze them. And they'll look uh, to the extent to which tiny organisms in the earth have eaten away at the fabric. And apparently, the holier, the better. So before we dive any further... Um, into this uh, pair of underpants. I do want to throw it over to you, Michael. Uh, what was your overall thoughts when you were reading this article? Did you learn anything new? Did it inspire you to do some research of your own? Like, what are your thoughts on the status of burying two well, thousand pairs of underpants? Yeah, first of all, it's a lot. It's a lot of underwear. I think the article said it was it two pairs for every volunteer. Was it two pairs? I believe it says here that. One of the pairs will be dug up sooner than the other. Yeah. I'm trying to see the exact timetable, uh, unfortunately. Oh, here we go. The first one will be dug up after one month, and the second mm. one will be dug up after two months. Yeah, so first of all, this whole thing is insane, because <laughs> when I first read, <laughs> uh, got sent this article from Brandon, obviously, um, I'm very immature. I'm a boy still. I'm not a man yet. So the term soiled unmentionables was the, immediately the first thing that popped there's out. No, to there's me. no age limit on that. There was, <laughs> there was no helping it. Um, so I immediately, my first thought was that they were doing some type of experiment trying to use like human waste residue for fertilizer or something <laughs> disgusting of that nature. I'm very glad that it isn't that. And instead we're trying to figure out what exactly is in the soil. Um, it's crazy though, to think that we can just gauge what organisms are doing what based off of the holes that they're creating uh it's crazy it's crazy and I, my my other thought was somehow underwear companies are going to use this as, as some publicity stunt in the future i'm i'm almost certain of it <laughs> i'm almost certain of it 
<laughs> yeah, it, it, it almost seems like it for sure. But apparently, the more you go down this article, the more I, I noticed anyway, I didn't realize how little is apparently known about yeah. the soil and the ecosystem within. It says here that the soil is home to billions of bacteria, fungi, insects, worms, and other creatures. I don't know what those other creatures might be. <laughs> Honestly, but, I, that's stuck out to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> but it does say that little is known about their ecosystem and how it affects things like crop yields and food protection, mm. which obviously is very important to, I don't know, the sustainability of human life on this, this planet just, or something uh, this like This planet, that. yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... Um, yeah, uh, but something I didn't know, it said apart from the waistband and the seams, our test pants, that's an interesting way to refer to them, are made <laughs> from 100% biodegradable yeah. organic cotton, and it serves as a food source for various microorganisms. What are your thoughts on that, Michael? They're literally eating, as as Bart Simpson will say, eating shorts right now. They're eating pants <laughs> underground as food. Uh, that's crazy. I, my immediate thought is who th who was the person that who's the first person that tried this and found out that this was actually working? Is that a specific job? Is that someone that that was just a scientist that said, I'm just going to try uh, making this new underwear and throwing it in the ground? But uh, it's crazy what can be used as food for these organisms. What's what, like I said, what's more curious is discovering, I guess, what's what's actually doing the eating. What don't we know? The, the vastness of this unexplored ecosystem being discovered through underwear is is just amazing yeah it, it is it is truly incredible like that potentially underwear can teach us so much about a yeah. field of science that we have yet to tap into its full potential of our <laughs> understanding underpants of all things i underpants, mean and, and, and and like you said you know it, it's kind of be fun to be a fly on the wall for that conversation to me i'm wondering i'm like okay they they wanted they found a way to to <laughs> test the soil health to understand better the ecosystems of the various bacteria and insects in the dirt and they were like yes actually a hundred percent cotton is the perfect <laughs> way to do this but like where are we gonna get a bunch of random cotton fabric from from and then somebody was probably like guys there's a sale on underwear we got the hands sale going on it's down already the street. Made. It's time. It's time. We don't have to make <laughs> anything. It, the legwork is already done. Literally. Crazy. <laughs> so crazy. It, it is. Um, but another interesting thing, and it says here in the last paragraph of the article, the citizen science aspect of the project is designed to raise awareness of global soil erosion. Increased use of fertilizers and construction are thought to be two of the major factors accelerating the loss of fertile soils, as well as habitat loss. This can lead to poorer protection against natural disasters and increased levels of chemicals seeping into streams and rivers. So it seems like in addition to the hopefully vast amount of scientific research and better understanding of the soil that the scientists are going to collect from this data and learn more from these pairs of underpants. Yeah. It seems also this is serving as a way to raise more awareness about soil health and, and, and the implications of what we do to the soil, how we pollute the soil, and what we can better do to have more fertile soil to, to not just help with food growth, but even potentially natural disasters and yeah. raising awareness, literally two pairs of underwear at a time, I guess, <laughs> <laughs> uh, per volunteer. And then, of course, to everyone who reads the article and watches this stream here today. So, yeah. guys, I, I hope we've helped raise some of this awareness. Um, yeah. <laughs> this, this this seemed like a, a, a really fun story, I thought, to, to headline our oh, show absolutely. today. Um, absolutely. It's it's short, sweet, to the point. It's an easy read, but there's a lot to unpack here, a lot to unravel. Um, I definitely learned something new from it. Uh, Michael, uh, did you learn something new from this article? Today? Absolutely, absolutely. And going back to the awareness element, once again, I had no idea that we were so ill-informed or I guess uninformed about the the organisms beneath us, the earth beneath us, and the ripple effect that soil erosion is causing. We need to protect this earth. It's crazy to think that something as small as underwear uh, being put in the ground is going to, is going to possibly make a huge difference in how we approach this conversation in the future. I was just thinking too, in the science books in the future, if this becomes like the, the thing that's going to set the stone for, uh, for soil erosion research, are they going to teach us about this underwear in the future? You think our kids, are our kids going to be learning about it this way, Brandon? 
<laughs> I don't know. This could be, I think, a fun science experiment to do at uh, I home. Think, potentially. I was thinking the same. I was thinking the same. You know, we kind of have like a little, like uh, almost like a garden out 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 front, out of our apartment complex here. I mm. wonder if I were to just sneak a couple pairs of underwear a few feet <laughs> down, see what happens. And I can maybe this. let. And maybe, maybe I can this. get a little bit off my rent. Be like, you guys want to learn more about your soil health? Like, this is what you got. Hey, do. you're protecting this complex from from yeah. the dangers of future natural disasters by doing this. It's the first step. <laughs> the first exactly, step. exactly. <laughs> but no, in in all seriousness, um, this is a, this was a great read, guys. Uh, if you're interested in learning Definitely. more, like I said, uh, link is in the description down below to this article. Um, I would love to check back in on this story down the road and see what uh, was yeah. uncovered. Um, from all this research, I think uh, this would be a fun one to keep tabs on. For I sure. feel like I feel like you picked the right articles for like a future episode to do just an entire recap on all of this stuff because <laughs> everything is just setting up for something bigger in the future for crazier research. So thank you for having me on, man. This is awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm gl I'm glad you're already having a good time. We're only a, a, about a third of a way through here. Woo, but, yeah, let's uh, go. A lot, a lot more fun to be had. A lot more science Perfect. to be had. And, uh, and and like you said, I always like try to pick stories that we can revisit down the road. That's yes. kind of what we're doing with our special segment this week. But we've got a little bit of ways mm. to get to that. Um, I want to jump into our next story for today. But before I do, I just want to thank everyone currently watching at home. If you're watching on replay, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we have Raul Alejandro Mendoza in the chat. He's been on this channel before as part of a Brandon Hanna Live uh, amazing talented filmmaker uh, extra absolutely he, uh, he's he's uh he's got a, he's got a great uh, mind for film so uh, one of the join best him. one of the best yeah. join him on this show once a month guys go check out his stuff uh nerdy chicano uh free plug for you there raul <laughs> <laughs> oh, we also of course have sabrina ramirez in the chat as always and william belford saying what's up science geeks and a surprise for me here we have joe benoit in the chat joe is an old engineering school buddy of mine and he's saying oh. that I had science classes with Brandon, and this is no act. He's this excited about science <laughs> on and off camera. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate that, Joe. That really means a lot. Um, guys, I definitely did not pay Joe to say this today to up my that, that was a free plug right there, Brandon. That was Honestly. a free plug. Get, listen, give a free plug, get a free plug. That's, That's the way we here. do it. Exactly. Rising tide raises all ships, guys. Mm -hmm, let's let's mm -hmm. let's build this community up together. <laughs> I know we can do it. But guys, uh, if you're watching, friendly reminder, please hit that like button if you're enjoying today's content. Like I said, leave a comment down below. Or if you're watching live in the live chat, you want to be a part of the conversation, like let us know your thoughts. And also uh, hit that subscribe button, guys. Maybe that little notification bell as well. So you don't miss a thing because we're talking about science every single week on this channel with an amazing variety of hosts uh, and guests uh, that are coming on. And you're not going to want to miss uh, what we've got coming up in the future. Um, super excited to have you all here. Let's jump into our next story. Here we go. Uh, I was hoping for a smoother transition, but uh, you know, sometimes it just doesn't pay off. But that worked. That worked. Come on. What might pay off is a new technique that can make some plastic trash compostable at home. And this story comes from Science News, and it says a pinch of Palmer munching enzymes. My pronunciation on this show is bad. Who? What? <laughs> Hey, let me try that again. Show, Come on. Yeah, it's a science show. Let me try this again. A pinch of Palmer munching enzymes could make biodegradable plastic packaging and forks truly compostable with moderate heat. Enzyme laced films of the plastic dis disintegrated in standard compost or plain tap water within days to weeks. Um, so this is, I think, a really, really fascinating article and kind of like ties into the story we yeah, were just definitely. talking about, um, about pollution, about litter, about soil health in general. Obviously, plastic uh, litter is a huge problem. As this article touches on, there's a lot of pl uh, plastic out there that is biodegradable. It kind of breaks down into tiny little pieces, but all it really does is break down into smaller pieces of the same no. plastic that just cause a lot of harm to the environment. And so there's apparently this new technique um, of basically just infusing these en enzymes into the plastic makes them actually compostable. Um, the article talks about, uh, they even had a photo that I don't have here, but I do have another photo for you guys. They even had a photo uh, showing the plastic in water. And after yeah. a certain period of time, the plastic completely dissolved into water. 
Um, but the photo that I do have for you guys here uh, is, is this fella uh, that you can see. Now, uh, in this, the caption on this photo says, in experiments, enzyme-laced plastic film, which is on the left-hand side of the image, broke down after three days in compost. And after two weeks, it disintegrated entirely. So um, there, there you have it, guys. That is, I mean to disintegrate entirely into compost. I mean, that is potentially a big deal. If this is something that we can utilize in all of our plastics that, you know, you go and get Chinese takeout, you get a plastic fork or uh, even plastic water bottles, probably. Although I don't know how the water would hold up inside of it. <laughs> Biodegrades inside of water. But we'll, we'll, we'll figure that one out eventually, guys. <laughs> but uh, before I do my typical rambling on that I love to do on this show, let's throw it over to to Michael. Uh, what were your overall thoughts on this article? Did anything really stand out to you as being particularly interesting that really excited your scientific mind? Yeah, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is the fu the for sure the future potential of this. I mean, you and I both live in the general LA vicinity and we see litter constantly, right? All yeah. the time. Um, so to think that this could possibly be used with more than just this specific type of plastic in the future with all plastics is crazy to think that, you know, slowly over time, like this type of pollution from plastics won't be an issue. But Currently, it is. They're trying their best. I think in the article it said that they're they've already patented the enzyme, correct? So they're on their way to trying out more and and possibly who knows? Like you said, maybe they're going to figure out with water bottles next. Maybe it's going to be Chinese takeout. But uh, we're one step closer to to eliminating this problem, which is awesome. Uh, thankfully, and like you said, it ties back into the first article. We just need to protect our Earth. We live here still. We still live here. Yeah, and 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 you know, like you said, this is like one step towards hopefully something much greater. You know, the mm. article does touch on embedding polymer chomping enzymes into biodegradable plastic should accelerate decomposition, but that process often inadvertently forms potentially harmful microplastics, which is kind of like what I mentioned earlier. Um, but we do have, and I want to I want to try to give uh, this uh, scientist uh, credit, mm. and I know I'm going to butcher your name, but I apologize, <laughs> Ting Zhu. Um, so her team added individual enzymes into two biodegradable plastics, including polylactic acid commonly used in food packaging. And they inserted the enzymes along with another ingredient, which was a degradable additive that Zoo previously developed. Like you said that there were like, you know, yeah. this was like a own, like an invention, um, which ensured uh, the enzymes didn't clump together and didn't fall apart. And the solitary enzymes grabbed the ends of the plastic's molecular chains and ate uh, as though they were slurping spaghetti, as the article <laughs> says. The visual um, that that provided was fantastic. Yes, uh, great <laughs> visuals. And it says severing every chain link and preventing microplastic formation. So it seems like um, uh, Ting Zhu and her team were able to take a process that we already have in place for our plastics, which makes them biodegradable, but we have this issue of clumping and just smaller, tiny little plastic pieces forming everywhere and not actually being compostable into the soil. But Zoo has um, developed this degradable additive that actually prevents them from clumping together and actually helps them compost into the soil. So this is um, a really like groundbreaking invention yeah. uh, to say the least, but it does say this technology doesn't work on all plastics because there's different varying molecular structures and there's these limitations that zoo and her team have to overcome. But, you know, like we touched on um, she's filed a patent application because uh, definitely do <laughs> that. Do. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> definitely do that. I mean, not only are you going to help us toward a better world, but you know, you might make a, a, oh, yeah. a, bit, of, a bit of coin. Oh, along the yeah. way, which I highly encourage. No, but all <laughs> jokes aside, this is one crazy. Um, this is just a. There's, I don't know. I'm like overwhelmed. This is just crazy implications. And like they say, there's a quote here that says, "We want this to be in every grocery store." And I couldn't agree more. I know that yeah. you're in agreement, Michael. Um, is there any 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 other thoughts that you had regarding this article? Anything that we didn't touch on? Anything that stuck out to you that made you want to learn more about compost and soil and 
biodegradable plastics. <laughs> I know very interesting topics. It honestly it is now, and I appreciate these articles. Mm. I mean, like we talked touched on the visuals that these articles are providing make it a lot more digestible for sure. But touching on this one, it's it's crazy to think that people are creating enzymes. <laughs> with with unknown effects like we we don't know what that's like initially when they tried it out with the plastics how many failed enzymes they probably had how many years this has probably taken to get to this point so uh yes uh zoo please get your money you you must uh, <laughs> for, for for this and i think that you know slowly over time more and more people are going to start as as we're doing right now discussing this topic doing more research into the ripple effects of our soil health and uh, slowly, I think we're we're moving toward this being a commonplace thing where we're we're hopefully having multiple bio- biodegradable sources of uh, disposal for our our goods that we drink and consume and whatnot. Yeah, certainly. And you know, we're talking about you know to go back to that photo. I'll I'll bring it up one yeah. more time for you guys. Um, to go back to this photo and, and the caption that was tied with it, uh, two weeks it took for this plastic film um, as it started out on the left. And what you see on the right is three days into the compost. Two weeks in total, it disintegrated entirely. We're talking about two weeks of something that... <laughs> Seriously. I mean, plastic, like, I mean, how many terms, how many times did I hear this in elementary school from teachers, how long it takes plastic to biodegrade mm-hmm. in the soil like hundreds thousands of years potentially <laughs> um and we're talking about two weeks uh, for not only to be biodegradable but compostable that is uh i i find that it's truly yeah. incredible it's almost if i didn't see it in this article if somebody just told me it'd be <laughs> seriously too good too good to be true but to me it's like but that's i mean that's the the beauty of science like that's why scientists do what, what they do that's you know why we do this show because i mean this is an amazing story that i don't know if i would have saw if i wasn't hosting this show every week yeah um, thank you brandon for, for educating <laughs> no. us dude <laughs> no no don't thank me i'm just a guy with an engineering degree who's trying to sound a little smarter than he is <laughs> quick, but no, quick I, thing though that yeah. that picture is crazy how long would you have thought that that was in the soil if you didn't know it was three days uh, years <laughs> definitely <laughs> years. Honestly, right exactly honestly <laughs> i almost even thought they were two different plastics at first that was my first thought first. i had to read it again i, I thought I think that, took- that was showing the different types of yeah. plastic they were using i think i i read that caption three times uh before i finally <laughs> realized yeah. what exactly was going on it is truly remarkable and this is of course another story that i can't wait uh to follow up on mm-hmm. and um yeah, I mean that. I mean that. That's just. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think of something else to say about it, but I think we just about covered everything. It just, guys, it's just so crazy. It's, it's just, just so, so crazy. crazy. It's left me speechless. It's left me yeah. speechless. But guys, uh, go and check out uh, the article for yourself if you'd like. Um, it's it, it, it is truly um, a great uh, invention, and I can't wait to see how it progresses further. Mm. But speaking of inventions, plural inventions that. Uh, are here and now and doing amazing things while they're on Mars, okay? (laughs) And we have a couple stories today I wanted to talk about because um, Mars's Perseverance rover that recently landed, we talked about it on this show. I had Sabrina here with me. We talked about um, Perseverance landing on Mars and how incredible that is and all the cool things that we were waiting to see, all the cool experiments. Um, And the two amazing developments recently, uh, we have... Uh, the Ingenuity helicopter making its third flight. Uh, and that's just crazy because like it seems like just yesterday we were talking about like, oh my God, okay, it's got to come out of the rover and the rover's got to like drive away. <laughs> and like, it looks like there was like something wrong with the hatch, like fell on the ground. And we were like, oh my God, like, is this thing going to fly? Is this thing going to work? They were having software issues. I was getting nervous. I'm sure they were getting <laughs> nervous over at NASA. This is their For baby. Sure. Absolutely. But now we're here. It's already on its third flight. Um, and as and this uh, story about Ingenuity in particular comes directly from NASA, guys. And it says here that NASA's Ingenuity Mars helicopter continues to set records, flying faster and farther on Sunday, April uh, 25th. 
So like literally just yesterday, <laughs> then in any test, the person doing the show on the Monday for the first time, am I right, guys? <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> then it, 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 it flied faster and further than any test that it's ever done here on Earth. Like, let alone on Mars, like it, they didn't even try this out on Earth, which for reasons we can get into in a little bit. But the helicopter took off at 431 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, um, which was 1233 p.m. local Mars time. If apparently <laughs> if you guys are keeping track, uh, rising 16 feet or five meters in the air, which is the same altitude it had on its second flight. But then it did something a little different. It zipped downrange 164 feet or 50 meters, just over half the length of a football field, reaching a top speed of 6.6 .6 feet per second or two meters per second. Um, so this is uh, really remarkable. And the scientists and engineers over at NASA, they are already digging through a trove of information gathered during this third flight that will inform not just additional ingenuity flights, but possible Mars rotocraft in the future, which has me particularly excited. Like what other kinds of helicopters are we going to oh, put on Mars in the future? Will astronauts be able to fly helicopters on Mars in the future? Dude, yeah. I would... I, <laughs> At first, you know, I just sidetrack. I did not want to go to Mars if I had the opportunity. <laughs> moon, yes, because I could see Earth from the moon. I could see my Absolutely. house from the moon. I'd be like, okay, it's there. It's not on fire. We're good. Mars is significantly further away. That really just, that scares me that that's going to be a one-way trip. But if you could promise me that I could fly a helicopter on Mars... Now you have my interest. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that is just, that is, that is really cool. Um, and we have a quote here um, from Dave uh, Lavery, the project's program executive uh, for Ingenuity at NASA's headquarters in Washington. He said, today's flight was what we planned for. And yet it was nothing short of amazing. With this flight, we are demonstrating critical capabilities that will enable the addition of an aerial dimension to the future of Mars <laughs> missions, which is exactly what I'm talking about. This is oh, yeah. what I'm here for. Um, before we go any further, Michael, let's turn it over to you. Do you agree? Are you just as excited for the aerial future Dude, of Mars missions as I am? This is so crazy because <laughs> immediately when I was reading this, I was just thinking about Halo, the video game series. And I was like, those dudes are flying whole like cargo planes and stuff in space. This is going to happen like this. This is the first step into getting people in like full on helicopters on Mars and, you know, roaming, roaming the surface in, in, a, in a cool whip. That's awesome. Uh, it's also crazy that this isn't a big deal. Like this isn't something that just like common knowledge at this point that they're taking this thing off in general, even for the first two flights I've, without this show. I mean, I wouldn't have known about that. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's insane to think that they were, they have been able to get a craft to physically take flight <laughs> on Mars and the possibilities that all of these stories open are, are amazing. And hopefully we'll be flying and cruising uh, in the skies of Mars one day, Brandon, in the helicopter. Definitely. You're there as my co-pilot. I think I'm <laughs> manifesting it. I'm manifesting it happening. Let's do it, man. Um, but I also, before I forget, I do have a video of the third flight yeah. because one of the other amazing things about the Perseverance rover for the first time, um, we have like high definition video and sound being recorded mm -hmm. on the surface of Mars. Before we've had to deal with these beautiful and they're gorgeous high definition panoramic photos and a little bit of our imagination. But now we actually have video from the surface of Mars, uh, which is just mind blowing to me. But let's 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 show that up here right now. And ooh, there yeah. we go. I could have us both on screen. <laughs> this is awesome. Here we go. Sometimes I forget how this software works. Dude, so oh, oh. amazing. <laughs> let's let's hit this play button here. Um, so as you can see, it's in the bottom left corner. Its rotors are spinning, um, and it should be making the trip up. Oh, there it, there goes. it goes up into the air. That is absolutely incredible like we're watching video of an rc helicopter flying on mars right now <laughs> literally and i mean there it goes i mean that's just nuts to me and the amount of precision the 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 way that you know uh software engineers were able to write in these algorithms to, to yeah. program in advance to make sure this thing does exactly what they need it to do because as the article states and what we can get into in, in a moment here is 
Um, and I think it, I don't know if it, it should be coming back sometime soon. I don't know. There it there is. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> they they had some troubles of their own on uh, Earth uh, testing test flight yeah. this guy when they had direct control over it to kind of sort of kind of like pre-program uh, something here and make sure it works on the surface of Mars. That's wild to me. Uh, that's mm -hmm. absolutely wild. Um, so let, let me pull my notes back up here and get back into the article. So like I just mentioned, um, what is that? I hear, oh, I had something playing on my end. Could you guys hear that? No, Oof. we're good. I, I think we're good. All right. <laughs> See, I, I, I accidentally, I, I stopped the, uh, I stopped the <laughs> screen sharing, but then the next video auto played on me. And whoa, it was whoa, very loud. whoa, what's going on? Yeah, <laughs> that was quite startling. <laughs> the, okay. the alarm on your face. I, I could like, sense how bad that was. <laughs> that was really loud, guys. I was, I was like, what's going on? <laughs> okay, Ooh, crisis averted. Back to the science here. So we have, um, and I'm gonna try to pronounce your name right uh, as well. Mimi Ung or Mimi Aung, um, the helicopter's project manager at JPL, said this is the first time we've seen the algorithm for the camera running over a long distance. So there's also a camera attached to this helicopter that is collecting data, and that data is what they are using to, like they said, not only. Uh, future ingenuity flights, but potentially future other Mars aerial missions, potentially other Mars helicopters in the future. Um, but they said that you can't do this inside a test chamber. And that's exactly what they had to do um, on Earth. Uh, vacuum chambers at JPL are filled with wispy air, as they called it, <laughs> uh, primarily carbon dioxide, which is to simulate the thin Martian atmosphere. Um, because uh, like sidetrack, if you guys don't know, uh, whereas uh, Martian or Martian gravity, I think is like about a third that of Earth's mm -hmm. its atmosphere is like one percent that of Earth's Mars atmosphere is exceptionally thin. And there were people that even doubted them being able to pull this uh, ingenuity helicopter off at all because of how thin uh, the atmosphere is. It's incredibly difficult to you know push on air with those rotor blades as you can imagine there's not much air to push on so how are you going to generate lift but they found a way to do it and it's absolutely incredible um but to get back to the article here it says they don't have room for even a tiny helicopter to move more than about 1.6 feet or half a meter in any direction inside of their vacuum chamber at jpl that they used to simulate the Martian condi <laughs> conditions and test fly this. Yeah. So it posed a real challenge, and they they had no way of testing the capabilities of the camera as it's intended to design. It says, would the camera track the ground as designed while moving at higher speeds on the red planet? There's no way of knowing. Yeah. Uh, because there was no way of testing it here on Earth because of how small their test chamber was. So it's really incredible to kind of see. Uh, scientists and engineers at work yeah. and use, you know, theory and, and everything that they know about the, the, the atmospheric conditions and the environment that the helicopter is in and program a way for this thing to work <laughs> without being able to fully test it here on earth. Um, which I, I think is, is, is truly remarkable. Um, so Michael, I want to th throw it back at you. Um, th as you can see, I'm very excited. I love, <laughs> I love environmental test stuff i yeah i've i've you know i've 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 worked uh, a job before that required a lot of like environmental testing like simulating mm -hmm. different environments for whatever technology you're developing and i always thought that was just super fascinating to kind yeah, of it, it is simulate to simulate a foreign environment in a test lab or wherever you are uh i don't know that's something that's really mundane to most people that gets me really excited so i want to no. ask you was there anything that stood out in this article that excited you yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if you're going to play the video, but there is a video of them reacting to the third flight going, mm -hmm. like actually being successful. And like you just mentioned, like going through that trial period of just the unknowing, not being able to truly, you know, use the technology the way it was intended or at least test it out is insane to think that they <laughs> took this gigantic uh, financial and also emotional gamble. I, I mean, you briefly touched on it, but it's like I, I there are people behind this doing these things that this is their life's work to 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 try this out to even get this far. So to have that moment, I mean, I can't imagine how satisfying that must be, and it is thrilling. I mean, even for me to 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 watch not only the video of it taking off, but like I said, their reaction to that thing traveling 
half a football field and they had no idea how far it would even go. It's, it's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's great. And it is amazing to me how successful the Perseverance Rover. Oh yeah. Oh, excuse me. It's, it's so far. A little burp <laughs> come up there. Unprofessional. <laughs> but, but, um, but no, not that I had any doubt in the great people at NASA or JPL. I actually have a, a few, a few old coworkers of mine that work at JPL and oh, got to awesome. work on some of this stuff. And I'm like really jealous of them, but it's, it's truly amazing. And they did an amazing job. Um, but it's not the ingenuity helicopter is not the only thing, um, that's been a great success, um, for the latest Mars Rover. Um, NASA's Perseverance Rover also guys, well, it makes oxygen. That's right. It takes co2 and converts it into oxygen and they've done this on mars for the first time and this story that i'm bringing up here comes from scientific american guys and uh as it says nasa's perseverance rover just notched another first on mars like we were saying um one that may help pave a way for astronauts to explore the red planet someday uh, the rover successfully used its MOXIE instrument to generate oxygen from thin carbon dioxide dominated Martian atmosphere for the first time, demonstrating technology that could both help astronauts breathe and help propel the rockets that get them back home to <laughs> Earth. Like, because, yep. I mean, guys, if you don't know, oxygen is, is very combustible, like hydrogen and to make water and all of a sudden and it's necessary for my health and not explosive anymore. <laughs> That's crazy to me. Chemistry is nuts. But anyways, guys, um, <laughs> that's something that I didn't even consider. I'm like, awesome. Like you can make your own oxygen on Mars, like not only to breathe, but for rocket fuel to get you back yeah. home. And then that way you don't have to lug all that rocket fuel with you to Mars and you there can save is. on weight. Because I got to tell you guys, when it comes to, to space travel and designing things to go into space, every single gram matters. Every single ounce matters. It is it is like so insane um how specific they have to be um to design uh things that go up into space in terms of weight um but anyways to to go even further into this the moxie milestone occurred on tuesday april 20th which was just one day after the perseverance watched over um its first uh ingenuity helicopter flight which we're already now on its third if you can believe it in a span of six days um and so, guys, uh, I will just give a little brief rundown of how it, the Moxie here works. Uh, the toast, the size of a toaster, the toaster size Moxie, which is short for Mars Oxygen in in situ uh, resource utilization experiment. I don't know what in situ means. I probably should have Googled that earlier, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to learn something new after this here show. We go. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the Moxie produces oxygen from carbon dioxide, like we said, expelling carbon monoxide as a waste product, which we know is bad. But I mean, you're like pumping it into Mars a little bit at a time. What's the harm? I don't, hey, don't want to jump too far there. Don't want to jump too far there, but we'll yeah. <laughs> The, Mar the Martians won't mind, I swear. Uh, <laughs> but the the Moxie team warmed the instrument up for two hours, and then they had and then they had it crank out oxygen for an hour. And within that hour, Moxie produced five point four grams of oxygen, and that is about enough to keep an astronaut breathing easily, according to NASA, for ten minutes. Um, so it's an hour of work for ten minutes of oxygen. But they said that this first effort isn't even Moxie's full capabilities. In fact, it can generate about 10 grams of oxygen per hour, which will probably correlate to roughly 20 minutes of breathable oxygen. So 20 minutes of oxygen per hour of work, I'd say that's pretty good. Um, oh, yeah. To think if you initially show up on Mars and you do bring your own oxygen to like start off, you know, but then you like, are you show up at a facility on Mars that we've like, you know, started to make a little bit of a colony perhaps uh, like in the Martian, but hopefully it goes a little better. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and maybe they have multiple Moxie instruments generating oxygen uh, full time for yeah. the site. That is, that is crazy. That is um, truly remarkable. And we can go into that a little bit more, but Bef and bef to stop myself from rambling on about something I'm really <laughs> excited about, I want to give Michael the chance to be excited about it as well. Uh, what were your thoughts on on Moxie's success? Uh, what did you learn for the first time reading this? Did anything really pique your interest that made you want to learn more, perhaps? How excited are you? Just tell me. 
I'm so excited, Brandon, because one, we're one step closer to our helicopter trip now. I mean, yes. come on. <laughs> of course. But also, I mean, I was just thinking, even when you were saying it, it just brought it back to mind that this is with one moxie. Imagine it with two or three. Ooh. Obviously, the financial investment to that is insane, but we're not so far off from the Martian being a reality now. That's that's the crazy part about all this. It's not some fictionalized thing anymore. People are going to be watching that movie one day and saying that it's scientifically wrong because we've done it now. Like, <laughs> it's crazy. Um, but to think that this is also just part of this one mission and they're doing so much uh, with the rover currently, the Perseverance currently, it's... It's mind blowing. We're it feels like the amount of science that is happening is is way more exponential than the actual like singular mission that they were intended to go on, right? So I mean, wow, this is the thing that's the size of a toaster and it's going to change like space travel forever. We may be able to get to and from Mars with this thing, like with a, a more advanced implementation of the Moxie. So it's yeah, it's insane. It's very exciting. Very very exciting. Yeah, it, it, it is, like I said, truly remarkable. Um, and as we have here, there's a little part of the article about the MOXIE and humanity's future on Mars, as it says. <laughs> um, the MOXIE itself cannot produce enough oxygen to make a difference for future exploration efforts. So that just sounds oof, like it's just slapping us in the face of all of our excitement. All, all of our fun but, is gone now. <laughs> but let's keep reading. Maybe it'll get better. For here example, launching four astronauts off the Martian surface would likely require about 15,000 pounds or 7,000 kilograms of rocket fuel and 55,000 pounds or 25,000 kilograms of oxygen, uh, according to NASA officials. Um, and uh, so guys about the whole rocket fuel does have a little like pair of, you know, a parentheses in here that, that just says rocket propellant consists of fuel and as an ox and an oxidizer that helps it burn. So that's what they need the oxygen for in terms of the rocket fuel. It helps us fuel itself, but it also acts as an oxidizer. Um, if you care to know that little bit of detail, I figured I'd share after <laughs> mentioning it earlier, yeah, but however, however, much larger MOXIE successors could potentially be great exploration enablers, allowing Mars astronauts to live off the land rather than depend on costly and infrequent resupply from <laughs> Earth. So there you have it, guys. MOXIE, as it currently stands, the size of a toaster, you're going to need a, an un, unfeasible amount of these units to keep <laughs> astronauts alive on the surface of Mars. However there are going to be successors to the moxie there are going to be bigger better faster stronger moxies in the future oh, yeah. that we are confident i'm confident anyways i hope the nasa is confident as well that they are going to be able to sustain human life on mars and produce enough oxygen for the astronauts uh to breathe the colonizers of mars if you will and uh, also to supply rocket fuel for them to safely make a trip home, which as nice as it is to breathe oxygen and fly helicopters on Mars, I think it's also going to be pretty <laughs> nice uh, to be able to make the trip back home. Uh, yeah. Michael, would you agree with my assessment? Yeah, I, as much as our helicopter trip sounds like a lovely time, a lovely afternoon, mm -hmm. we have to get home at some point. And, and that's obviously the main mm -hmm. the, the main topic of discussion here. Uh, whatever the future m incarnation of the Moxie is, it's going to change the world probably. I mean, this is already... The fact that we're able to create oxygen on a planet with none right now is just what the heck. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. 10 years ago, this is, this would be a, fi a fictional thing as well. And now here we are. Um, so, yeah, dude, one step closer. One step closer to, to astronauts getting to explore the surface for at least a little bit of time. It's crazy. Yeah, it absolutely is incredible. And, you know, to kind of touch on, you know, being able to test these instruments and this technology here on Earth in hopes that it survives <laughs> yep, on again. Mars and that it works on Mars. And we're seeing this level of success. I did, I did read something that said that, you know, I think the last time uh, NASA technicians were even able to physically touch Moxie was two years ago when they put it into the Rover as they were assembling wow. it. It's it, absolutely incredible. Um, the amount of time it takes to very precisely and carefully assemble these Mars rovers and you just got to hope that whatever you built is going to yeah. make the trip <laughs> the, That's so the, the crazy. Trip to Mars. And fortunately for us and the amazing, talented uh, people at NASA, we're seeing great success from these experiments. 
and wow. something to get me really excited um, because I, to be honest, I didn't even know about the Ingenuity helicopter or Moxie until they had already landed on the surface of Mars. <laughs> so it is, it is, it is really, really exciting stuff. Um, oh yeah. And I, I, I can't wait to see what the future brings. And we do have, uh, right as we're wrapping up here, Ferris joining us in the chat, uh, saying scientists are like Oprah with these underwear. Like, you get underwear, you get underwear, there you it get is. underwear. Everywhere you the underwear the goes. You got to put it in the soil and then we're That's taking the most it back. Part. Yeah. But you get it temporarily. Um, <laughs> and he also comments on my hair. Thank you, Ferris. Oh, yeah. Uh, I was saying before the show, it is really difficult to manage. I do got to get a hair. You look good, man. Too. You look good. Uh, if it's not a show if i don't bring up my messy hair at least once <laughs> but but yeah guys um i hope to bring back this special segment mars mission report in the future i i i'm sure that i will because there are a lot of exciting scientific experiments going oh, yeah. on on mars these days and a lot of amazing data coming back um to the people here on earth faster than ever uh it's almost too hard to keep up six days ago there was no flights on mars and now we're talking about our third uh, so it, it's absolutely incredible and we'll just have to wait and see guys. But with all that being said, that wraps up our show for today. Michael, thank you so much for joining me. I had an absolute blast talking science with you. Uh, you are like such an exciting person. I love the enthusiasm <laughs> that you bring uh, to Thanks, any man. show that you're on. Um, let the good people watching know where can they find you online? Where can they see more of your wonderful face? How can they support you? Let them know, plug everything you need to plug right now. It's going to go down. Well, first of all, Brandon, thank you for having me. I'm a fan of the show. So it's an honor to be here sitting, talking science with you. I'm glad that my excitement shone through. Um, <laughs> but you can find me obviously right down here. Brandon's got it already. Michael Chu for real on Twitter. Um, you can find me at Letterbox at Michael Chu and not YouTube at also Michael Chu. Keep it nice and simple. Uh, movie reviews, as you guys, as Brandon mentioned, I'm the host of Chew on this. And uh, he's actually going to be our next guest on Mother's Day. Our hey. episode will be oh, dropping. Oh, wow. <laughs> Special Wonderful. present to, to all your mothers out there. Me I'll and let my mom know so she can check it <laughs> yeah. out. <laughs> yeah, you got to let your moms know, guys. Me and Brandon will be talking on May 9th. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited to, for you guys to see it. We talk all things science some more get into our love for Halloween and it was an absolute blast. So thank you again for yes. having me on Brandon and thank you for coming on chew on this. I can't wait for the folks to see it. Man. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me on chew on this. Thank you so much <laughs> for being on the show today. Uh, giving I, us I thank yous now. Like, Oh, I've had an absolute blast. Just give it out. You get a thank you. You get a thank you. Ferris will wait and see about you. You know, you know. no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but yeah, no, I uh, really appreciate it. I know my mom's going to be super excited. I'm going to say, I'm mom, glad, I know it was a big deal when I was in the schmo down, but now I'm on chew on this. I I've really made it. Ooh, I've really made it. Time, this, this is, is the, the big, big time. time. <laughs> uh, but in all, in all seriousness, it really is a wonderful show. You're an incredible interviewer. Thank you, man. Uh, it was a wonderful experience. So guys, please go check out my episode of Chew on This when it does release. And check out all the other episodes that Mike has on his channel. Um, it, it, it's it's a wonderful show uh if if you if you, if you have a, a few moments to spare um and if you also maybe have a few moments to spare for me you already have because you're watching thank you so much you found me youtube.com yes. this is where we're at but you can also find me on twitter and instagram at brandon hannah 07 i also do have a patreon patreon.com slash brandon hannah if you're looking to support uh the show support myself and all my crazy endeavors that I'm trying to do in this wonderful space called the internet. Um, I would really love to have you there. I'm really trying my best to build a community here on this channel of science lovers and movie lovers alike. And I think there is a beautiful harmony there, uh, much like in film physics, where we can try to make it all work. So check me out on, on all those places if, if, if you can. And um, Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that little notification bell. Leave a comment down below. Join in on the conversation. I want to know your thoughts on the underwear in the soil, <laughs> the compostable plastics, the amazing uh, technological achievements on Mars. I want to know about it all from you. And, and until next time, guys, thank you so much for taking time out of your day for this 